Alrighty, are you guys ready to rock? This next session is amazing. It's with my friend Mark Giovanni uh, doing orchestral music in the box. So without any further ado, let's do it. Hi. We're gonna learn how to use your gear and equipment and libraries to compose cinematic music. You're gonna see the behind the scenes of the exact step-by-step -step that I use to compose and orchestrate cinematic music for my movies, trailers, and video games. The number one question that I get when I teach music composition is, how do you make your library sound so good? And that's exactly what we're gonna learn here. We're gonna learn how to compose music that sounds good, and no, it does not require any mixing skills or using any expensive plugins. Then, I'm gonna teach you the top five film music cliches including trailer and how to compose fast and efficiently if you've got any questions you can send me an email at mark giovanni at cinematiccomposing.com either way either myself or someone in the team will respond to your questions in less than 24 hours now before we start who am i and why you should listen my name is mark giovanni i live in los angeles in 2010 i did my first soundtrack for a feature film since then, I've been doing movies for major studios that have gone to main channels and the streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime. In 2011, I was given the opportunity to teach at Berklee College of Music. And since then, I've been teaching and composing. But in 2016, I left Berklee and I started my own music school, Cinematic Composing, that since then has enrolled over 5,000 students that just like you want to learn to compose our casual and cinematic music. Some of our students have won awards, composed music for feature films or documentaries, and got placement in major trailers. All right, so secret number one is use at least two MIDI CCs at the same time, not just one. So when we wanna make our instruments sound alive, we're gonna use modulation, right? To do dynamics. And that's fine and good, but add also at least expression with modulation, both of them at the same time, to add an extra layer of dynamics to your sound. Right? And sometimes we can even add more things, like for example, for strings, we can have a third that controls vibrato, uh, or maybe a fourth that controls the position of the bow, like from sul ponticello to sul tasto. Now you don't need to go crazy and having 20 different MIDI CCs controlling different aspects of your instrument, it's gonna make things too complicated, but understand that the more you do, the more realistic your music is gonna sound. Now, these are my top five dynamic moves. The first dynamics move, it's very simple. I call it the Lord of the Rings, and it's very useful useful for like slow homophonic strings chords and it goes like this you're gonna use two midi CCs at the same time modulation and expression and it's gonna go up and down every two chords up the first chord down the second chord and the trick is the a little step or drop in between chords it goes like this The second one is called the double push. Works great for final crescendos. You're gonna use expression and modulation. And there's gonna be a first push to sort of like the middle, then back up a little bit and then go back up. You're gonna end first with expression and then bring up till the end modulation. And it sounds like this. And in a real life example, First push gives the S for tattoo to that note, and depending how fast or slow, you're gonna give it more or less character. And the second one adds the crescendo till the end, adding first volume and then ending with modulation for aggression. The next two moves are for melodies. Here's how a musician interprets a melody. They're gonna add a little bit of weight at the beginning of each note, and then a little bit of decay, depending on the length of the note, the longer, the slower the decay. So watch me do it and see if you notice something. If you notice, there are a few things. First, at the beginning of each note, there's a little bit of a drop. That helps connect the notes and gives it realism. Second, at the beginning of each note, there's always sort of like a small crescendo for shadow type of thing that adds character and weight to the note. And then the longer the note, there's always a slow decay. What you are seeing here is this one is expression, so it's basically the patch volume. This one here is modulation, so it's 
characters, dynamics. And then finally here, this is number two, breath control. This controls vibrato. So as you see at the beginning, I add volume, dynamics, and vibrato. And then this patch in particular allows me to control the attack of the note. So with number nine here, I can overlay either forchato, marcato, staccato, spiccato. So this is what I've done here at the end. I added a staccato. And then here, even using a legato patch, I added these staccato notes at the end. And then the next move is sometimes within a melody, there's a note repetition. So for example, if it's piano, arp, celesta, guitar, it's easy. Just repeat the note and that's it, right? But there are other instruments like flutes, trumpets, strings, that when they repeat a note, it's somehow connected and they, they can connect it more or less, more separation, more connection, right? There are some libraries that if you repeat that note real quick, they are gonna trigger that connection between notes. But if you don't have one of those libraries and you want more control, here's how you're gonna do it. Notice this drop here in expression modulation, and I added by Rato as well, but with expression modulation will do it. It does the tom, tom, tom. So it's two notes, but I didn't actually repeat the note. Because the problem with legato patches is that the first note of the melody always has a slower attack. And if you don't have one of those libraries that allow you to do bow changes or repeated notes, it's gonna sound fake. It's gonna sound like this. And finally, long sustained notes. Don't just do that. This is a high pitched, long sustained violin note. And as you can notice, expression, modulation, a little bit of vibrato going up, and that's it. Create movement. The way this is gonna work is you're gonna do subtle quick moves with expression modulation, and then slower, bigger moves with vibrato if you've got control over vibrato, something like this. and then by Vrato on top. And this sounds way better than this. So before we move on, I wanted to stress how important this is. This is where music gets created. Yes, the idea originates in our head, but the same idea is gonna sound very different if an amateur high school orchestra performs it or a professional orchestra. It's gonna sound way better with a professional orchestra. And this is the same. So use the best libraries that you can afford and then get the most out of them. Practice and make them sound as good as you can. Secret number two is have a template that helps you, that inspires you, that allows you to work faster, not a template that limits you. So this secret is not about the fact that if you need a template or not. There are plenty of composers that don't use a template. There are more composers generally that have a template. And here's the idea that's gonna kill your creativity. I have a template that gives me all the options that I need. So when I sit down to compose, everything is ready and I don't have to load the instruments. And that is an idea that is logically it works. But the problem with that is that a sample library by its very definition, it's a simplification. It's just a sample of what an orchestra can do or an instrument or a section. Don't fool yourself with the idea of a template so I've got every option possible. Rather, create a template that allows you to compose fast and efficiently. There's a ratio where the bigger the template, the more technically complicated it gets. And those technical complications are going to challenge your creativity at some point. These are my top five rules that I follow when I have to create a template or update my template. Number one, inspiration. Make sure that your template inspires you, that creates momentum. In my template, up here, the first 16 tracks are my sketching patches, the fast action patches. I've got the short orchestral, pre-orchestrated patch, basically a combination of Albion and Symphobia, a little bit of cello spiccatos for definition in the strings, and I've got here choir if I would need choir as well. Same thing for longer strings and choir. 
remember those patches are for sketching. Sometimes I'll use those patches to sketch quickly and then I'll reorchestrate it later on so I've got more control. Now, these are the libraries that I use in Fovia, Albion. You can replace them with Nucleus or other ensemble type of libraries. Moving on with the sketching patches, Apocalypse is the next one for percussion. It's a mix of epic and or casual percussion from the low, mid and high percussion. And I can control if I want a closer, drier sound or a little more wet. Epic boom here, or filter it. Wire long note, this is Requiem. Piano, four times, so I can sketch and I can separate the melody, background, harmony, maybe counterpoint, and then I can copy and paste to other instruments. I recommend also having a separate patch for brass short notes, brass long notes, woodwinds short notes, woodwinds long notes. And then I've got some epic cinematic horns. <laughs> This is not a realistic sound, it's more like a cinematic big epic sound and it's a combination of a few things. 70% of the sound is a 12 horns ensemble from Cinebrass Pro, but then it has like a solo horn to add a little bit of definition and the Symphobia, the Marcato, sort of like a Sforzato patch that adds a little bit of character at the beginning of each note. Adds this shape at the beginning of each note. Some big heroic trumpets. With the strings, the same concept. I've got a small group of strings that will get 50-60% of the job done and that will help me for sketching as well. And then as I've been updating my template and I've realized what I need, I've got more string patches, the different instruments, the different circulations. But these are the basics. I've got sustained strings and staccato strings. These are ensemble patches, but I like to separate the highest strings and the lowest strings. The highest strings usually are violins 1, 2 and viola, and the lowest strings are cellos and double basses. For the sustained strings, I use a, an ensemble for the sustained strings, I use an ensemble patch from Spitfire Symphonic Strings. And what I do is I have this Poltec EQ that allows me to warm the sound a little bit if I need to. But I like to have the low strings separated so for routing purposes and for mixing later on. So I can sometimes add more reverb to the highest strings and less reverb to the lower strings. We'll talk about this later. Same deal for staccato strings. I've got the high staccatos and the lower staccatos. This track right here, when I need a um, sort of like more cinematic, maybe Hans Zimmer parts of the Caribbean type of sound. It's a combination of different libraries. It's Albion, Symphobia, and the latest scoring strings, cello, spiccato. The Albion makes it sound big. The Symphobia gives the aggression and smaller but more aggressive and then the LA scoring strings definition which sometimes is lacking in the lower strings and all together they sound like this I've got a concertino strings ensemble patch as well and a telos dbc for when I need a more realistic smaller sound. Basically the way it works is if you press one note you get all these patches at the same time. As soon as you start adding more notes they're gonna divide in different patches you're just gonna, and you're gonna get a smaller sound. And finally percussion is this group here. I call it orchestral enhancers because it's not just percussion. So I've got that Celesta. This is a Spitfire percussion, got timpani hits. I recommend having control over the tail of the timpani. Sometimes you want to hit and then let it ring, and sometimes you want to hit and stop it. And so what I've done is up here, longer tail, and down here, shorter. The way I've done this is I came into this patch here, I went to mapping, and then I selected all groups, select all the notes, and then just move them. Then a bass drum, cymbal swells, nerve hits, timpani swells, also from a Spitfire, drums, sometimes you will need drums in our orchestral context, few more instruments, tam-tam, timpani rolls that I can control with mod wheel and I can create from a low rumble, something more aggressive. Now for swells, I 100% recommend using a pre-recorded swell because it's gonna sound way more realistic and believable. Beati hits, 
Also, I, I'm able to cut the tail, long tail, short tail. Finally, Arb Glissando, and I can control the key of the Glissando as well as the type of a scale, major scale, minor melodic, and that's a Spitfire Arp. And then down below, I've got more things, but those 30, 40 tracks could get 90% of the job done. All right, so recap of my top five rules when it comes to building a template. Number one, template should inspire you. Number two, have a group of tracks that allow you to work fast, to sketch, to get momentum going. Number three, simplicity. Your template should be simple, especially at the beginning. Number four, have free space in your template. Make sure that the template does not take too much CPU processing, too much RAM. Make sure that one, you have free extra RAM available in case you need to load more instruments. And two, make sure to have some empty pre-routed tracks. I have them at the end of my template and they are here ready to go, routed, and the sampler contact is loaded. So I just have to double click, select the patch and go. And number five, modularity. I like to build my instruments, my multis, my patches inside contact. And then I save those contact instances. I may have five patches or 30 patches that I build a group of instruments. Let's say, for example, I'm working on a video game and uh, I need to create this type of forest sound escape and I decide that I'm gonna use um, wooden pitch percussion and I create a group of instruments that work well together, is well balanced, is well, well panned and it works. And so when I'm done with this project, I'll have to decide, I'll decide, should I keep this in my template? It's gonna take RAM and the space or not. If it's something that I see myself using over and over again, I'm gonna keep it. If I'm not gonna be using it over and over again, I'm not gonna keep it. Now. I worked hard on creating this sound and it's a good sound and there's, there's a possibility that I may be using it in the future, but I don't wanna have it in my template all the time. I save that contact instance. If I ever need it in the future, I just need to create 16 MIDI tracks that I can load in one click, route them to contact, and then in contact, open that multi that's gonna load the 16 patches that I already created that are balanced and penned and working perfectly. So this wraps up the template secret. Have a template that helps you, a template that inspires you, a template that creates momentum. So copy the things that worked for me, if you want, but ultimately the concept is do not build a template, a big template with the things that you think you are gonna need. Instead, build a basic template, template that helps you compose fast, and then have some pre-routed empty tracks so you can load instrument fast. Work on a project, and as you discover new instruments that actually help you, as you have to come up with new sounds for that specific project, if you think that that is going to be useful for the following project, leave it in there in the template, update your template. But again, don't put a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand tracks. That's gonna clog your system and that's gonna make things more complex because that is going to kill your creativity. Secret number three is create a space in your mix. The number one problem of orchestral mockups mix is the lack of clarity. It's muddiness in the middle low end, it's frequency stacking. So these are the top four things that you can do to gain clarity. Number one, composition. Make sure that the different musical layers have separation. Make sure that the melody and counter melody do not conflict or the melody and background harmonic content does not conflict. Make sure that there is separation. The more layers that you've got, the more complicated it's gonna get. Number two, orchestration. Decide if you want separation or association to sounds to go together. The easier way to create separation is number one, different registers, number two, different chambers, and number three, different articulation. If you want association, the opposite, same register, same type of timbre, for example, putting together two instruments that sound alike, like you can have the cellos and the bassoons go together. They're gonna blend very nicely. The bassoons are gonna add a little bit of definition to the cello line, but they're gonna blend very well together. So same register, similar timbre, and similar articulation. But again, understand where you want separation and use orchestration to enhance that separation. That's gonna help your mix a lot. So one composition, separate the different layers, two orchestration, 
understand where you need separation. Number three, panning. Now, most of the libraries that we use already come pre-panned. We will load the violins one, and they will already sound a little bit to the left. Cellos will already sound a little bit to the right. But still, we wanna close a little bit that panning and reposition to gain space. We wanna find the dominant channel. So for example, for the cellos again, it's gonna be a little bit of the right side. We're gonna close a little bit the panning spectrum and then move it a little bit to the right. We don't want it too narrow because otherwise it wouldn't sound realistic, but yes, we do wanna close it a little bit. And number four, EQ. Add EQ to each single track and patch in your template. Find the annoying frequency, the one that creates madness, usually between two to 400. Find that frequency and then bring it down a little bit. Minus one, minus three dBs max. It's not gonna change the sound character of that specific instrument, but when you put them all together, it makes a meaningful change and we gain clarity. All right, so the next secret is master film music cliches. Understand the different music styles, love, sadness, fantasy. It needs to be easy for you to write in one specific style, so then you can add your own spin and create your own voice. So we're gonna talk about love, sadness, suspense, action, mid-intensity, and fantasy magic. We're gonna cover first harmony in these five styles, and then orchestration, the same styles. So for love, it's going to be major chords, diatonic melodies. For sadness, it's going to be very similar, but minor, everything minor. Suspense is gonna be similar to sadness, but with a twist, some sort of dissonance to those chords that add that tension and that suspense. Action made intensity is going to be similar to suspense, but we're gonna have a motor, we're gonna have less harmonic changes, and it's gonna be less melodic and more motivic. So we're gonna have a motor first. We're gonna add a few dissonances to create that harmonic twist. And finally, the motivic elements. And finally, with Magic Fantasy, it's not as much about if it's a major chord or a minor chord, it's how we connect those chords. With the other styles, it was more diatonic, and now we're gonna be connecting those chords in parallel movement, seconds, major, minor, thirds, something like this. Or same thing, minor. You can also add some extensions to the chord, like the major or minor sixth. It's gonna give it a little bit of flavor, in this case, like an elfish fantasy type of flavor. All right, so this is sort of like the piano sketch. Now, how do we orchestrate it? In the next section, I'm gonna orchestrate some of the styles that we've covered. We're gonna start with action mid intensity, and then we're gonna do sadness, and then love, and finally trailer. All right, so for action mid intensity, we're always gonna have a motor that moves the music forward, that creates the tension. It's going to be mostly minor chords with a twist, slow harmonic movement, and it's gonna be motivic, not thematic. Okay, in terms of orchestration, we've got two options. Option number one is a more modern hybrid sound. Option number two is a more traditional orchestral sound. If we go for a more hybrid sound, usually the motor is gonna go to a pulsing synth and percussion. We can enhance that motor with a little bit of string staccatos, and then the motivic elements are going to go to other orchestral sections. And if we go for the more traditional orchestral sound, the motor usually is gonna be staccato strings and percussion, and the motivic elements are going to go to other orchestral sections. All right, so watch these two examples that I edited from a live class. In the first one, you'll see me first recording the pulsing synth and then adding some elements on top. The second one is the traditional orchestral, and you'll see me creating the motor with the staccato strings, then adding percussion, and then adding some elements on top of the motor. All right, so watch these four minutes of video, and then we'll move to sadness. 
and then let's see. Action with intensity is the type of music that creates tension, creates action, but it's the type of music that goes behind dialogue. So it's not gonna be like bombastic, explosive, really loud type of action type of music. It's gonna be something that's that that creates tension, something that creates tension and definitely has a pulse in the motor, but it's not too big. Alright? So we have to keep it down in dynamics, volume, and then register as well. This style harmonically is gonna be minor with a twist. So minor with something else, minor with a this or as minor with a note that's off from the scale. This motor tends to be quite static, meaning there are harmonic changes, but slow or very slow or non-existent. Meaning we can, we can have a cue in this C minor thing for like two minutes and then rely on textural development to add variation. But it's common to not modulate, to not even change chord. Um, it's actually very common. It's not a bad thing. Um, harmonically, it makes it not interesting, but it's part of the style because the goal for this style is to create tension, to add tension, to sustain the tension of the scene, not necessarily to add emotion, which is what harmony is very good at. Okay? Um, that doesn't mean that you don't have to change. You could have this. And then you, then you could change to... Right? You could do, you could do things like this. Short movements, so basically... Alright. So this is the motor. This is the motor. And I'm going to add some, some elements on top. Uh, I'm going to start with a long note, something like this. Wrong. Alright, the next one is sadness. Sadness is very easy to orchestrate. Most of the time it's going to be just the strings, like the violin is doing the melody and then the rest of the strings doing harmonic support. Sometimes you can have another lyrical instrument like a piano or a solo woodwind doing the melody with the strings support underneath. C minor. Flautando, pat. G minor with the B flat. First inversion. This is the F minor.
The next one is love. Love is like sadness, but with major chords. Maybe it has more color in terms of orchestration. It's less gray. Now, this is a slightly longer piece. So you won't see me composing the entire piece. You'll see at the beginning me doing the piano sketch and then the string spot underneath. And then I'll transition to the finished piece and how we explain each section in the piece. Super basic. We've got the melody of the piano, and then we've got the we've got the double basses, pizzicato, and then the the harp, harp. All right, and then it goes a little bit bigger. Uh, now we introduce the celesta. The strings coming in and out, they come in here and they stop and then towards the end, it's like, okay, this is the end of the section, then going back in again. But here's what we've got. Ar this is the harp, celesta, the strings, um, high strings, and then the viola comes in here. Woodwind coming in, it's gonna be the uh, oboe. It's bigger orchestration, so we've got the lower string somewhere here, the double bass, and cello legato. And then it continues. We have to connect this softer part with the loudest part, otherwise it's gonna sound abrupt, and we wanna avoid that. So to do that, we've added just two very cliche things, the cymbal swell, and then the arp glissando. And for trailer, another edit from a live class. Here's the thing with trailer music. Trailer music usually, it's not like a score. It's not music that follows a scene. There is not uh, different motifs or, or as many different motifs. Um, it's all about development. Usually it starts from a motif or a theme and then it's just repeating this thing over and over and over again. And uh, the variation Usually it's orchestration or textural. That's trailer music in a nutshell and very, very simplified. This part of the class is me teaching the climatic moment. So you'll see me first playing back the final piece and then composing that climatic section instrument by instrument. write the, the short notes, then we're gonna do the long notes. So for the short notes, we're gonna have mostly staccato strings and some percussion. For the long sustained notes, we're gonna have um, long string choir and low soft brass. And then we're gonna bring in the melody. We've got the staccato strings that will sound like this. with the low strings and I'm go I'm gonna go like no brainer. Right. No first inversion, second inversion. I'm just gonna keep it super super simple. So it'll do something like this. And then I'll move like parallel. 
Martin. You want to write this down because then when you are writing the longer strings, maybe you want to do something that's similar. Start like this. Soft percussion and a very, very, in like, this could be very loud potentially, like, very loud, sorry, but if, you know, keeping it soft sounds. Very, very nice. So now we've learned how to use the different musical elements to compose in different musical styles. But where do we go from here? How do we take this sketch and develop it into something bigger? The next part of the training is a live class where I talked about how to avoid composing bottlenecks and keep the momentum going and compose fast and efficiently. So I edited the best part of that class and these are the top five things that you should know to be able to develop your music from a sketch to something bigger, keep the momentum going and compose fast and efficiently. So we're gonna be talking about how to create emotion with harmony, counterpoint, development, how much time you should put, and finally a guided step by step. In terms of harmony, major chords, Right, so major chords, positive emotions, right? Major, uh, minor chords, negative emotions. Right? Um, now, if we move those chords, if we connect those chords, traditional way, diatonic type of thing, then for major chords, we're gonna have something like love, right? Type of thing, right? If it's minor, then it's gonna be sadness. If we connect them in a non that traditional way, like the Danny Elfmanish way, like the, connecting them by thirds, type of thing, right? Um, then we get more of like the magic, fantasy, supernatural, right? This this thing that we talked about in magic. If we simplify this to slow and homophonic, then we have supernatural ground there, where we have this. So C major, E major, E flat major. Same chords as, as fantasy. Uh, it's just a uh, slower, more homophonic, all right? This type, like the non-traditional chord progression with major chords, it's magic, fantasy, supernatural ground there. With minor chords, it creates this um, ominous type of sound, right? Like... And then when we start adding uh, extensions and all this, then um, with major chords, adds character and color with minor chords to add more tension, more darkness, more suspense, more thrill, more dark, more horror, if we go with two, with, with lots of dissonances. And then finally, when we are, you know, if, if we do a lot of um, changes, then is 
fast harmonic changes enhance the emotion, the slower harmonic changes provide support, right? So once you have this, once you put the first chord, you're still establishing a mood, right? It's an open fifth, so we still don't know if it's minor or if it's major. The moment you do something else, we start telling a story, right? If we introduce a melody, Right, this melody is telling a story already in an uh, emotional context, right? Uh, if we don't have a melody, just that the first harmonic change is gonna start telling a story as we move to... Right, that starts, so just, just, be, just be aware of the emotional power that just a harmonic change produces, right? Because sometimes we've got a scene We've got a video game, we've got, and the music doesn't need to do that much. The moment we go from here, we're gonna start moving emotionally the scene to another direction. Right? So it's so careful with that because sometimes we just need the counterpoint it's more it's the counterpoint creates complexity and complexity i look at this complexity on okay what different layers do i have and how do they conflict with each other and to me is um, I'm, i focus on separation or association right so if i want something to go together and then i make sure that i share more of these things right so there's no counterpoint Maybe I have a melody and I want to double that melody with another instrument, but I want to blend sort of those instruments to go together. I don't want to hear the two chambers. Then I'm going to do more of these things. If I have a counterpoint and I want separation, then I'll do less of these things. Less elements in common, more separation. More elements in common, less separation. What we've done so far is like, okay, so with for love, this is what, you know, what the chords that you have to use, the melodies that you have to use, and I composed, and then um, that's it, the sketch, and I orchestrated a little bit. How do we continue from that? How do we continue? So that's what I recommend, you know, do the first section, orchestrate the first section, and then do a quick connection, write the next section, and then see if the connection needs to be improved. So how do I start the new section? Look at this, look at the look at the sketch, what you've done, and then decide if you need continuation or, or contrast. That's basically what you need to do. Let me just give you a few examples. Section one. And section two, contrasting, right? Somehow, right? So connection will win um, rip. Right, we've got this woodwinds rip here. Right, this woodwinds rip, and then it's gonna connect with the next section. All right, contrast again from big to small, right? From thick to thin, from uh, busy to simple, right? Decided, I decided to do that. transition we've got this arp glissando here solo i connect the two sections and the, and the tail stays there because we're going from that big massive to all of a sudden super dry you know like very way more transparent texture and i wanted to leave that something underneath that background layer that we talked about so it tails off sort of thing connects the two sections all right so that's that's how you do it i'm gonna cover these things really quick but um how much time should it take it depends on you know if it's a trailer track for example when i get hired to do like an album with like two or three composers and we are doing this trailer quality type of tracks usually it takes me like three four days per track um, to compose plus mix and here's like day one frustration day getting you started day two productivity day three review and clean up enhancing traditional elements and all that day four mixing day five mastering that's usually how it goes for like one two minutes of music that you're freaking super proud of what you've done right if it's tv movie type of thing then usually one day compose as much as you can all right so that's how you compose an entire queue right you know have a clear idea of what you need to do for that queue right and then it's just to start create the sketch and then use the sketch as the polarity star and then compose section by section, good enough concept, next day, review, clean, mixing, master, that's it. All right, cool.
So that's it. That's it, you guys. If you've got any further question, please contact me, reach. I'm happy to help. Follow me on social media. Follow us at cinematiccomposing.com. Until then, let's write great music. All right, so this is the end of the first part of the class. Now we're gonna go with the second part of the class. And here's what happened. I recorded like two hours, then the editor edited everything and it ended being 45 minutes. It should be 55 minutes for this slot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bonus section, which is on mixing, because mixing is very important to make your music sound awesome. And so I'm gonna show you a technique that is very effective, very meaningful, and it doesn't require you buying any plugin. I'm gonna show you the three types of volume automation and as simple as it sounds, it makes a huge difference. So here we go. Today, we're gonna be talking about automation for mixing. And there are three types of automation that basically when we are mixing, we're like, what we were, what EQ, you know, what compression. And there's a technique that doesn't require you use any plugin. It's the cheapest because you don't have to spend any money. And it's the most effective neck with neck with panning. So when, when we get here at the mixing stage, which is here, we export everything from MIDI to audio sort of thing. And now it's here. Everything's balanced. We shouldn't I'm need to balance anything, edges. but sometimes we do need to rebalance things a little bit to, to find that final 10, five, 10 percent positioning to make it perfect. And then to add to open it a little bit, to add those reverbs, to EQ, to find a little bit more space, to reorganize in a, in a way that makes a little bit more of sense, that makes the music sound bigger, wider, more cinematic, and all that good stuff. So number one is going to be fluctuation. What this means is you're gonna have your, this is a MIDI controller, this is, this is a DAW controller. You don't need something expensive like what I just showed. You can buy one of these that just has one fader like the ProSonus one. And with that, you have um, everything that you need because when you select another track, then it's gonna select just that fader. All right, fluctuation type of automation. This works great for long sustained notes, something like this. So focus on the harmonics, string line, high pitch. It's just this. And that's it. As you can see here, there's a little bit of micro fluctuation. As you can see, the, the up and down is maybe like half of the beat up, half of the beat down. Really, it's not that much, but it makes it feel a little bit more alive. And that is something that mixing engineers will do even with live, with live orchestra. Music is vibration and um, live itself is vibration. And it's just moving things in a way that you know, adds a little bit of movement and detail and interest to the mix, makes it a little bit more unstable, but in a, in a, in a good way. Without. With. And if on top of that, you do a little bit, see how this goes up and down, up and down, following the music or what this specific track needs for this specific moment, then it enhances it a little bit more. At the micro level and at the macro level sort of thing, these longer curves, it's just... Fluctuation, it's a micro movements up and down. It's gonna add a lot of movement and a lot of dynamism. And so moving it is gonna make it feel like a real orchestra performing live that long note and trying to keep it sort of like in the same level all the time, but with the human imperfections that make the music sound good. All right, so this is the first type of automation. The second type of automation is when we've got this big melodic line, which is one enhance that, those dynamics and that emotion. It's like, 
here's the orchestra record and here's this mixing engineer that can do stuff that's gonna make it sound even better should we do it or not well we are doing music for uh, for for movies for video games are trying to you know enhance those human emotions the reason why we are doing this is because this is you know going beyond what the orchestra did which was, was a great job but enhancing it so it reaches even farther and enhances those and reaches for those human emotions that we want to reach so that's why we do these things not because we want to cheat or anything like that all right so we're talking this guy here i already already recorded these dynamics but here we go All right, so then, dun, dun. three notes, it's a melody, it's a motif. What's the shape of the melody? Dun, dun, dun. Down, so up and down. It's basically this, right? That's, that's what we're gonna do. This already would be good. This uh, at the beginning was a little bit too, too too soft, too low in volume, but it just enhances it like without. It's good. It has those dynamics. But what if we could cheat and make it even more obvious? That's it. If you've got the skill and you're used to do this, you can do that micro chord within each note. Way better. This needs a little bit more at the beginning. Especially, especially this, this, this ending, this makes it way more natural sounding. I like it very much um, compared to not having this. This is the most obvious one when we're enhancing the expression and the dynamics of melodies and things like that. Okay, the third one is similar to the first one. It's not as obvious. It's at the micro level and it's what I call micro counterpoint. We've got this uh, cello line, then we've got this pulsing bass, the cello line pulsing bass, right? And they're competing with each other and it's, and it's a game, it's a counterpoint, right? And um, we've composed it in a way that makes sense and it, it's easy to hear each one of the ideas. But when we get to this point, we are mixing and it's like, let me make a little bit of a space. Each time one of the lines need to shine, need to stand out a little bit. not super obvious we've got it blind with it's kind of like the cellos is this guy here so we've got a tremolo with the shorter strings and what else we've got going on we've got that that pulsing bass thing it's down here somewhere this guy so it's basically these two elements, and then we've got more stuff. But in that range, in that mid-low, we've got these two elements. So let's just do that. The day, yeah, oh, I'm gonna push it a little bit, and then that moment we're gonna bring it down. Just the, the pulsing bass, subtle, maybe two, three dBs. That's uh, that's, that's basically it. Let's see. At that point, we are losing a little bit of um, of weight, of energy, of musical energy, because that pulse was carrying a lot of it. And so, by getting rid of that, it's a little bit too much. So maybe we can push a little bit those. Maybe the the tremolos a little bit as well. Ah, that's it. That part here, which is, seems very, not very important. It's super important actually, because this is the motive that the piece evolves and develops from this motive from here till the end for the next minute and a half. So it's very important that we can hear this motive clearly. Four. And after.
much better. Subtle, subtle, but meaningful, much better. You, you're gonna listen to this once. It's not like the composer who listens to this 70,000 times and everything makes sense to you. For the listener, the clearer, the easier to understand what's going on musically, the better. All right, so that's all from me. I hope you got some value. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Michael for putting together this amazing event and I will see you soon. Bye-bye. Amazing, right? Could you imagine Mark Giovanni on Red Bull? <laughs> he just crammed an entire semester's worth of stuff into an hour. I love this guy. I love the way he teaches. Highly recommend his courses based on so many of our members that have recommended his courses. Actually, it was the member's suggestion is the reason he's here. Um, so yeah, go to cinematiccomposing.com. Check it out. He's got a special offer for taxi members to get like a whole package of courses at a ridiculously low price. I mean, seriously, go there today. Check it out. Um, also, I want to mention that Dennis Sands is a friend of mine from 40 years ago, and he is one of two leading mixers for major motion pictures in the world, doing big orchestral stuff all the time. So they took pieces of what he teaches about mixing orchestral in the box stuff, and that's gonna play on Friday for the members only road rally uh, at 3.30 p.m. Also, I want to mention that coming up after this at noon um, are Nancy Moran and Fett doing a thing called Creating Compelling Vocal and Instrumental Arrangements. That's really good. And then immediately following that, we're going to have a really tight little tech switch over that I hope we don't blow. There's going to be um, a video from a company called Air Gigs. I have absolutely fallen in love with this company. They're a sponsor uh, of the Road Rally, and what they do is very cool. It's all about finding people that you need to play on your stuff or signing up so that people can find you to play on their stuff. Um, the video is incredibly good. The company, the reason I love it so much is the owner of the company treats his company and his customers like we do a taxi so i feel like we've met a sister company so all that said you guys see you back here at noon high noon for a little fet and nancy action glad you could join us for um mark's thing mark thank you for doing it see you guys in a half an hour